v of, let's say, 0 lambda bar. So this would be v of, maybe I should call this empty set, the empty label. Um, the empty label here and 2, 2, minus 2, minus 2 over here. So what do I do? Um, this is, actually I did this way back when we were talking about um, this definition for the Jones polynomial. So I just take um, the free R module, spanned by all webs W, this is really isotopy classes, W going from x empty set to x lambda. Okay, so that's an, that's an enormous, there are lots and lots of webs. Okay. And then I divide out by a relation Okay, where I say that W0 is equivalent to W1 if, so the bracket of W0 W prime is equal to the bracket of W1 W prime for all W prime going from x lambda bar to x empty set. Okay, so these compositions now are closed webs, and I know how to evaluate them. Okay, and what I get is some vector space, which is the space v0 lambda bar that I want. Yep. So will I recover the, um, no, so, so from this over here, um, okay, so yes, okay, all right. So yes, you will recover the web relations from this statement, right, because the web relations hold in any closed diagram. Okay, so once you know that they hold in a closed diagram, then if you make this definition, then they, almost for free holding an open diagram as well. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, so similarly, If I give you some web going from x lambda to x mu, um, this induces, um, let me just call it phi w going from v0 lambda to v0 mu just by sending a web W in here to the equivalence class, oops, bad choice, W naught, to the equivalence class of W naught W. Okay. So knowing how to evaluate closed webs just in this universal way lets us figure out what the vector spaces are and what the maps between them are. Okay. Yep. Are there, oh yes, uh, that's a, yeah, so there are definitely, yeah, it's no longer, right, so when we thought about the Jones polynomial, um, there was sort of a canonical basis for this space, V0 lambda, say, that was composed of the simple planar tangles. Okay, it's unfortunately not the case. There are, you know, there are more uh, that, you know, there's not some set of simple planar webs that forms a natural basis for this. Okay, so the, you know, yeah. Okay. All right.
right, so now we could try to categorify this picture. Okay, and to do that, um, we should have, for example, a closed web W should go to some vector space A of W. Okay, this is like in Kovanov homology, we had a bunch of circles and we assigned to it the vector space that was the TQFT applied to those circles. Okay. And so what I want to talk about is how, you know, how do you construct this vector space A of W? Um, and similarly, all right, so then so a cobordism, let me put this in quotes, uh, say F going from W0 to W1, say these are both closed webs, goes to um, A of F mapping from A of W to A of W1. Okay, so we want to understand how we can construct these things. Okay, and so first we need to say some words about what the analog of a cobordism is in this world. So, the analog of cobordism is a foam definition. So a foam is a subset. So like a cobordism, it lives in um, R times I times I. Okay, now a cobordism, I could say that the, it's locally modeled on something that looks like the Euclidean plane inside of this three-dimensional space, right? That's what you know, manifold is. So here we're going to have some more local models just because webs have more local models, right? They have these trivalent vertices. Um, and they also have these colors so modeled on. So there are three sort of possible local models. Maybe I'll draw them in orange. So one is that locally near a point in your foam, it just looks like a plane, I didn't want a dot there, I wanted a number, with a number, which is the weight, just like the sort of weight that we had on webs. Okay. So another possibility is that I could have um, a trivalent vertex times i, or maybe times since, you know, since zero, one, since it's kind of an open model. Um, and again, here I need to have sort of a, b, a plus b, a weight constraint on these edges. And now since I've got a, gone up a dimension, I have to have one more sort of singularity, which is, um, so the third local model is the cone on the one skeleton of the tetrahedron. Okay, and on the tetrahedron I have to label some of these edges. Here I have, say, A, B, C. This is A plus B, I think. This is maybe B plus C, and this is A plus B plus C. Those are the weights on the cones of those edges, assuming I've gotten this right. Okay, and again, you know, that, okay. Um, the level of detail we're operating at, that's probably sufficient. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that, there, yeah, okay. So there's supposed to be orientations on all of these things, and I've been sloppy about, you know, maybe I should say 
with orientations. And I, I mean, I'm just going to be sloppy about describing them. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, then, then we can form what's called the Ricard complex, okay, which is an analog of that complex that we defined in the category Cobb NN. Okay, so it's kind of a formal complex in the category of these foams. And what it looks like is we just take the formula that we had for the crossing and turn it into a complex. Um, so maybe here I had K and L, and K was bigger than or equal to L, and then I think I get something that looks like um, K, L, uh, da, 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 da. Oh, gosh, I'm confused, no. Right. Um. <coughs> You know, let me, uh, right, um, so here, H, I have this weight. So here, I, you know, maybe I'm going to put this H here. I'm going to do sort of H is 0, and then go to H is 1. Okay, and so forth and so on, and then down to H is L. Okay, so I just take the WIBs that I saw in that sum, I arrange them in this natural order, and then it turns out that there's a nice foam cobordism from one to the next. Okay. But, you know, this is, this is still like that sort of completely formal complex that we had in Cobb NM for the Kovanov homology. Okay, so to really get an invariant, we're going to need to pass to a quotient of this foam category in the same way that we passed a, a quotient to get the Barnaton category. And how are, how are we going to get that quotient? Um, Well, maybe let me just describe how we get, um, for example, this vector space here. Okay. So, how to define A of W when W is a closed web. Okay. So, in fact, uh, you know, it turns out there are lots of different ways to describe this category in terms of representation theory, in terms of geometry. Okay, so the, these categories have actually been pretty intensively studied, but I think maybe the simplest way to describe it is due to um, uh, Robert and Wagner. Okay, and their approach just mimics um, the Murakami Atsuki Yamada method. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. But before, before I say that, let me say one thing. So, to get um, a not invariant, we must pass to a quotient of foam, let's say, so this is the analog of Cobb, foam lambda bar mu bar. Okay, um, satisfying some foam relations.
analogous to the, rota the relations we wrote down to define Barnaton's category. Right there we have the sphere relations and the neck cutting relations. So here there's going to be some really eye-turningly complicated looking diagrams that these foams have to study, sa satisfy. I'm not, I'm not going to try and write them on the board. Okay. Um, okay, so how, you know, how, how, can you, how can you find this quotient and see that it's well defined? Okay, so Robert and Wagner's approach is to define a, an evaluation on closed foams So let's call it bracket of F, where this is now a closed foam. Okay, and this is again as a state sum, <coughs> kind of the way MOI defined the evaluation of a web. But now I have to choose, you know, on this, on each face of this surface, I have to choose labels from one to N. Okay, in the same way that, uh, you know, here I'd have to choose n elements of the set, one up to big N. Okay, and then, you know, again, I have to write down some power of Q associated to that thing, um, which I won't do, but Robert and Wagner did. So you define some relation some evaluation on closed foams, check that it satisfies, it satisfies the foam relations you want, and then apply the um, Blanchet, Habiger, Mas Masbaum, Vogel construction. to get A of W. Okay. Um, all right, so we've got a few minutes left. I had foolishly thought I would talk about uh, what to do in the case where um, the colors are not exterior, but I think that with the amount of time remaining, that's a terrible idea. So. Let me say something else that I wanted to say, which is, um, you know, what, you know, why, right? So the, at this point, the categorifier's job is done. He's defined, you know, some vector space, you know, which categorifies the lambda k polynomial. Um, but what, you know, what, why would you care? What sort of, you know, what, what should you do with this information? Okay. And so one thing that I want to say is that very often these categorifications have a lot more structure um, than the original polynomial. And that structure lets you understand things about the polynomial that you might not otherwise have understood. Okay, so, um, so, say, categorified polynomials have extra structure um, which lets you see things that you know, you might not have guessed about the original polynomial. So for example, here's a conjecture of Gukov and Stosich. So let's say it this way. If K P over Q is a two bridge knot, Then, um, then what? 
let's say, the dimension of H, the wedge K homology of KP over Q is just the kth power of the ordinary wedge one homology of KP over Q. Okay, and this sort of behavior is totally invisible on the polynomial level. Or at least, you know, does not seem to have been observed before now. And I think, you know, one of the most intriguing of such observations is uh, a conjecture of, um, let's see, Stosich, maybe, maybe I'll just write initials again. So Stosich, Kucharski, um, Sulkowski, and Reinecke. This is just the order their names occur to me. Um, and it says that actually um, all wedge K um, Humphrey polynomials of K are determined, right? So according to the definition I'm giving, th these things ought to look really terrible, right? I mean, you have to, you have to write down this web and work in this huge cube of resolutions and evaluate the web and see what you get, and it looks really complicated. So, but nonetheless, the conjecture says that these are determined by a relatively small amount of data. Let me say it this way. A vector space equipped with a quadratic form and two linear forms. Um, so it's not quite how they phrase this. They think of it as saying that you have a quiver, but I think this is maybe a little bit easier to say. In particular, it's um, it's true, so this is a theorem of Marco Stosic and Paul Wedrick, um, that uh, that this is true for two bridge knots. And moreover, that the dimension of this vector space is just the determinant of the knot. You know what that is. It's the Alexander or the Jones polynomial evaluated at minus one, um, which is P. Okay. And uh, you, might, you might look at this and say, well, why should I believe, you know, two bridge knots are super special. And that, indeed, it's a, it's, two bridge knots are super special. So it's a, a really interesting question whether this statement is true. This is an incredibly strong statement about these polynomials. Um, it's an interesting question whether this is true um, more generally. And one, one reason that um, you might think or hope that it's true, which was the original motivation of these guys, is that uh, it implies the uh, LMOV conjecture, which is about sort of the integrality of some rearrangement, you know, some generating series that you build out of these wedge K Homfley polynomials. So if you know that the precise version of this statement is true, then you also know the LMOV conjecture for that knot. So, you know, if you believe the LMOV conjecture, you might hope that, you know, this, this is true too, and that it's explaining why. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to stop now. Question?
Uh, you know, I, th I think that's, I mean, I, I mean, I, I think it's at least as hopeless. I mean, you, you could ask, I mean, is the answer known for all the colored, you know, if you look at all the colored Homfley polynomials, are those complete not invariants? I mean, um, is that true? So certainly the Homfley polynomial itself is not, right, not a complete not invariant. But I, I th you know, I thought that if you looked at like, say, the Homfley polynomial with all possible colors, then it, was, it might be open whether that, you know, if that's not true, you should, you should tell me. Uh, um, okay, um, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, so I, I think I don't know these complexes, so maybe, maybe you should. Oh, okay, the, all right, this, um, yeah, okay. Um, yes, uh, okay, and so, all right, so the, the question again is, Um, you know, I think, I think, yeah, no, I, I think somehow, you know, on the mathematics side, that, that project has a lot of analysis that's required to go into it. Um, and I think in some sense people have thought quite a bit about the analysis and maybe not so much about the geometrical, you know, I, I, I certainly, you know, don't don't know anything, but um, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right then. <laughs>